Welcome to Physician Focus. I'm Dr. Mavis Jaworski. Cardiovascular disease, which includes heart disease, stroke, and high blood pressure, is the number one cause of death in American women, claiming more than 400,000 lives a year, more than all cancers combined. This edition of Physician Focus, presented in conjunction with the Massachusetts Medical Society's Committee on Women in Medicine, will take an in-depth look at women and heart disease, examining such questions as why are women more threatened by heart disease than other illnesses? What are the gender differences that play a role in this condition? And are there differences among racial, or ethnic groups, and can women do something to reduce the threat? With me for this discussion are Dr. Melissa Wood and Dr. Nandita Scott, co-directors of the Corrigan Women's Heart Health Program at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Dr. Wood is also an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and director of the MGH Corrigan Menahan Fellowship Program in Women's Cardiovascular Disease. She is the 2014 recipient of the Massachusetts Medical Society's Women's Health Award, presented for outstanding contributions to women's health in the Commonwealth. And Dr. Scott is an assistant physician in medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital and also co-director of the MGH Cardiovascular Disease and Pregnancy Service. She is the recipient of the Partners Healthcare Partners in Excellence Award for the Women's Heart Health Program and was previously named Physician of the Year by the American Heart Association, Cape and Islands District. Welcome, ladies. Well, clearly, you have the credentials to be talking about this topic. Thank We're you. We're very excited to be here. We're so glad. It's such an important topic. Let's start off first by defining what is cardiovascular. What does it mean? So cardiovascular disease is um, obviously the heart. Um, we also include with that stroke, so um, you know blood vessel disease, and also any type of vessel problem. So we have um, blood clots in the legs, um, blockages in arteries. Um, we have valve disease, irregular heartbeats or arrhythmias. Um, you know that it's like anything related to the heart, the whole gamut. Why is it taking so long for women to become more aware of how serious this problem is? For a long time, most of the studies that were done that looked mm -hmm. at heart disease included predominantly men. Uh, women were not thought to be you know, candidates for heart disease, and so they were not included in the studies. I think women also were so busy raising their families, taking care of their kids, taking care of other people that they didn't even think about the symptoms that they were having. Now we're beginning to focus on women, not only in the research world, but also clinically. So I think women are now beginning to become more aware of the fact that they have risks for heart disease. Let's talk about some of the preventive measures. What are they? So I think one thing out of everything we speak today is everything, the risk to women, most of it is preventable. So taking good care of yourself, exercising, eating healthy, making sure that you know what your cholesterol should be and what your number is, what your blood pressure should be, and what if you ha and be screened for diabetes as well, not mm -hmm. smoking, of course. And if you have high blood pressure, managing it Correct. and yes. following it. Mm -hmm. I think one of the keys for prevention is actually partnering with your health care provider. I think many women don't go to their physicians or nurse practitioners regularly and I think it's very important that you have that partnership so that you can stay on top of your numbers and be aware of your risk and manage your individual risk factors on a day-to-day -day basis. Is there a particular ethnic population that is more at risk? I would say women in general are at risk, but I think the awareness about cardiovascular disease may be lower in Hispanic women, African American women. There may be higher prevalence of um, um, obesity, diabetes, um, high blood pressure that is potentially untreated. So I think women in general are at risk, but we definitely need to focus more on these specific populations. I see. I see. And how about family history? Family history is very important. It's one of the, the risk factors that I think are often underappreciated. So it's really important when you go to see your primary physician or your nurse practitioner that you, you talk to them about the things that have happened to your family members. Most importantly, your mother, father, brother, or sister. And the things that we ask about include things like early disease of the arteries of the heart, but also things like diseases of the aorta, like Marfan syndrome and other things like aortic dissection. 
Other conditions that can be inherited include arrhythmia such as atrial fibrillation. So it's very important to kind of be aware of that information when you go to visit so that your doctor can assess your own personal risk as it relates to your family. Have you found in your experience that sometimes when you ask about the family history that they really are very vague? Absolutely. I think I absolutely. I mean I think, I mean, I don't want to say it, definitely. People, yeah. people, I think Melissa made a really wonderful point is make sure you know your history before you go in to see your doctor. I am constantly amazed at how many people, they think you're asking what killed their father or their mother. Mm -hmm. You know, what was their cause of death? Mm -hmm. But they don't think, no, we really do want to know. Did your family member have high blood pressure? Did mm -hmm. your family member have a stroke or a heart attack, those things, Correct. or blood clots? Blood right. clots are a very important thing. For instance, blood clots in young people, things like blood clots in the leg, blood clots in the lung, or early stroke, those are very significant factors that suggest some type of problem with the blood clotting you know, system. And I think women need to remember that if you have a family member with something like that, you have to be very careful if you take something like the birth control pill or estrogen replacement because those are uh, very much increase the risk of blood clots. So what is the most important conversation with a young woman when she's going on birth control about heart disease? Well, I certainly ask if she smokes because <laughs> smoking and, and taking yep. a birth control pill is a very, very lethal combination. It actually increases the risk of stroke or heart attack. I also ask about mother or sisters or aunts or family members with uh, early blood clotting disorders mm -hmm. because I think a lot of people don't ask and don't realize that even these new very low dose birth control pills or patches or implants can really increase your risk of blood clots if there's a family uh, history and a problem. And the only one thing I would add is that there is a relationship between frequent miscarriages and blood clotting disorders. You might want to ask about that because if you have some this specific problem, taking a birth control pill is not ideal at all. That's a very important point. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Very, yeah. And other things that young women are not aware of, of, needing to be mindful, to be really watching out for this threat to their health. So one thing that's really dear to my heart is that, you know, I, I deal with um, pregnancy and heart disease, and a lot of, 10% uh, of our population develops preeclampsia or eclampsia during their pregnancies where their blood pressure goes up, they make a protein in their urine, and then they deliver the baby, the preeclampsia goes away, but what people don't realize is that actually increases their risk of cardiovascular disease over their lifetime. So for me, I ask every single one of my patients because it is a risk factor. So can we have a specific definition then on Preeclampsia and eclampsia, what those are for the viewers. I know you've touched on it yeah, in, sure. your, yeah. in your So preeclampsia is elevated blood pressure, um, protein in the urine that may prompt premature delivery or delivery of the baby earlier than we'd like it to be. Eclampsia is when you actually develop seizures, um, so obviously much more serious. And the earlier you have your preeclampsia and the earlier your baby's born, the higher the risk. And we don't really understand is, is preeclampsia causing damage to your blood vessels and that progresses through your lifetime? Or does it mean that you have the risk of heart disease and that um, this, you failed the stress test of pregnancy because it is a big burden on the heart system? And how common is preeclampsia? It's about 10% of our population, but higher in, in specific in groups. Specific groups right. Yeah. Right. But even at that, 10% is something. One out of right. 10, exactly. Yeah. And other right. factors are uh, premature delivery or mm -hmm. babies that are small for gestational age because that suggests that the placenta isn't delivering the appropriate amount of blood to the baby. Mm -hmm. And again, suggests an underlying disorder of the blood vessels and that will predict early risk, particularly of stroke, but also heart disease such as you know myocardial infarction or heart attack um, and other problems. If there was any one thing that you would really want to strongly affect change for women in regards to cardiovascular disease, what would it be? For me, it's really taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. So many of us are managing, as we said earlier, you know, our children, our parents, you know, our partners, um, working, trying to do all these things at one time. And I think women forget to take care of themselves. They don't pay attention to their blood pressure. They don't pay attention to their cholesterol, how much they weigh, how much they drink, how stressed they are. And all of those factors are very, very important. And I think stress is particularly an important risk factor today because women are managing so many other factors besides themselves and stress can be very, very high and that's certainly a big risk factor for heart disease. 
also a lot of people sometimes take the position that it's okay if I smoke because I go to the gym regularly. <laughs> right. It's okay if I eat this because I exercise all the time. They seem to think they're immune because they're having some other good health behavior. Corrective mm -hmm. measures. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. Corrective <laughs> measures. Have you seen that quite a bit? Yeah, for me, I see people who eat whatever they want because they're on a cholesterol medication. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. I take so, a statin oh, my so I can eat good. the double yeah. hamburger exactly. with cheese yeah. and well, the fries. Yeah. And actually, sometimes that's an issue with some people who are diabetics as well. Oh, my sugar is good, so I can eat this. Right. Now. Correct. Yeah. So I think it's medication is not always the way to go. You want to manage your disease also by that's some right. of your health behaviors right. or lack thereof. And, and those right. are free. You can. You, it's easy to go for a walk, you know, to eat healthy. Those things, those things are there's they're not Good prescriptions. Choices. Good they're choices, choices. Yeah, for sure, exactly. for yeah. sure. Yeah. And um, as far as screening, what is the appropriate screening for women for cardiovascular disease? So I think you know it is very, it's very individualized. So you need to speak to your primary care physician about that. Obviously, everyone should have their blood pressure checked at least once a year. Mm -hmm. Have your cholesterol checked, you know, f uh, frequently depending on your risk factor profile. Screening for diabetes, of course. Everyone should know their body mass index and what their weight should be. Um, and um, and then other specific testings, like more fancy testing, like stress tests and stress uh, ultrasounds, really depend on what we find and what your physician recommends. Yeah, at the time. At of the, the time. Of the initial screen. Exam. Um, I've been surprised by how many women are admitted into the hospital uh, with a diagnosis of stroke and they had high blood pressure but they were on medication and they're befuddled as to how in the world they ended up having a stroke even though they were on blood pressure medication. Though their blood pressure was very high in the emergency room. Right. The majority of people who actually are on blood pressure medicine and particularly especially women are not within the goals that we are now reaching for as far as blood pressure targets. So I think it's very important for people to check their blood pressure, report it to their doctor, and make sure that their blood pressure is in the range that they and their doctor feel it should be. I think that's an important fact, not only to do it regularly, but to document it. I like to uh, tell patients that I see in the hospital, I want you to check your blood pressure take it each morning before you take your medication, write it down, and if your number is this or this, you must call your primary care physician. Right. A lot of patients like to think we have you know, white coat syndrome. So mm -hmm. they'll say, well, I'm only nervous in oh, your yes. office, so my blood pressure is high, but when I'm at home, it's not high. And I think what we realize is when you have some type of stimulus, such as being in the doctor's office, well, that's gonna be like when you're driving your car down the Mass Pike. So really, <laughs> exactly. you know, we know so about that. It's, it's definitely going to be high more than you think. So I think you really need to check those numbers, pay attention. And I think especially today with all these gadgets and gizmos that we have, Absolutely. people have ways of following their blood pressure and following their heart rate and share that information with the healthcare team taking care of you. And I would say to your younger listeners, you know, we start damaging our blood vessels when we're young, when we're teenagers. So it's never too early to start. I think that's important in in particular with nutrition mm -hmm. because you have a lot of teenagers who are very active in sports and so they do a lot of loading with all kinds of food mm -hmm. and then that becomes a health habit right. right and it's hard to break that as you get older right. right right especially things like caffeinated beverages that the young athletes and young kids and young adults really like to take because it gives them that extra surge when they're at the gym we're realizing now that those things can cause really high blood pressure and heart rates that can be damaging. And I think you need to think about what it is that you're putting into your body, no matter how young you are. You know, what's interesting, I've had a couple of patients in the past, uh, the first indication that sh they might have high blood pressure when they came in to see me was, they'd say, I feel a funny buzzing on the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of that one? We have, I think. I think, but I think the, the what people need to understand is that most people have high blood pressure. You don't feel it. You don't feel it at all. It's, it, don't feel so it's the it. silent, silent killer, killer, right? Exactly. So that's why yeah. you need to have it checked. That's why, even you if you need. feel fine. Right. But they'll say, "But I, I saw my doctor last month." But if they had a wedding to plan for or kids graduating right. in that interim, where's their blood pressure at this right. point in time? 
I think it's also very important to remember that African Americans have very high blood pressure, and especially um, even before the age of 40, about 60 to 70 percent of African American women will have elevated blood pressure, and many of them don't seek regular physical exams and don't seek regular medical care. And so I think we need to remember that um, that different groups have higher risks, and so they have to pay attention to their numbers. Mm -hmm. In Massachusetts, is there a particular population you've already touched on mm -hmm. before, uh, some of the Latino population and African American, mm -hmm. any others? Because we do have a wide cross-section of ethnicities represented in Massachusetts. Any others that you can think of? Well, I would just say that the immigrant populations, um, we have many refugees, um, mm -hmm. in particular in some of our community health centers, and, and many of those women, for cultural reasons, perhaps don't seek regular medical care. And so I think we really need to reach out to them and make sure that they are coming in and getting their blood pressure taken. Oftentimes, women will come into the medical system when they have children, mm -hmm. yep. um, so during pregnancy, or for screening for breast health or um, you know pap smears. And so I think we need to take advantage of those visits to check blood pressure and to educate them about their cardiovascular risks. Well, we've been talking about high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Let's go into some detail on what the definition is of it. So blood pressure is um, when your doctor puts a cuff on your arm and we get two numbers. We get the top number, which is called the systolic, and that's the pressure in your blood vessels when your heart is pumping. And then your heart relaxes, and the diastolic or bottom number is the, heart, the, blood, the pressure in your blood vessels when your heart is relaxing. And why is it? that high blood pressure is so harmful. What is actually happening in the blood vessel? So when your blood pressure, that top number is high or the bottom number, it actually puts your blood vessels at excess stress. So it can cause blood vessels in very, very high blood pressure to rupture, or it can cause early hardening of the arteries because of that constant pounding against the blood vessel wall. It's also significantly, uh, an it has an impact on developing heart failure or shortness of breath because it affects the structure and the function of the heart muscle itself. What are some dietary things that they can do to manage their blood pressure better? So, I mean, one thing that is um, fascinating is that the NIH actually studied the DASH diet. So a diet was studied in a, in a, bit, in a big way, and this d diet actually lowered blood pressure. So it's very simple, low salt, um, legumes, you know, fish and chicken, um, nuts, you know, just a very healthy Mediterranean healthy type diet, of healthy right, diet, right. exercise lowers your blood pressure. Um, so there's, there's things that you can do before having to go on medicines if, if, if your blood pressure is not so high initially. And unfortunately, a lot of people who go out to eat, they oh get triple the amount of sodium for their day in one meal sometimes. One right? thing I love to do with my patients is, is I, I like, they tell me where they go out to eat and I Google the, the, the sodium content of the restaurant and they're amazed because if you have high blood pressure or have some risk factors, you should only have 1,500 milligrams of salt a day, which is 2 thirds of a teaspoon which if you eat out at one restaurant, you're easily getting yes. that or more. Well, and the thing exactly. that patients forget is that bread has salt. Like if you eat, if the bread basket comes to your table and you have the bread <laughs> and you have salad dressing on your salad, you've already reached 1,500 right. milligrams. Exactly. So I think those little innocuous ways that, blood, that, that salt can sneak into our diets really need to be paid attention to. It's interesting. Recently, I was on a flight, and the gentleman next to me told the stewardess, well, I think I'll have a tomato juice. I said, oh, that sounds good. And then she hands me the can, and I turn it around and look at it. <laughs> it's like 500 milligrams? Try 700. Wow. wow. I turned to him, and I said, oh, I don't think I'm going to drink this. <laughs> And anything that tastes good probably has a salt lot in it. of right. salt. Right. And in restaurants exactly. are not going to low salt their foods because oh, no. people it, won't right. eat them. It won't, right. They won't taste exactly. well. Right. Right. What are other things that they can do? Prevent it. We've talked about the exercise. We've right. talked about, you know, be, being cautious as mm -hmm. far as uh, birth control mm -hmm. and anything else that they need to be looking at in prevention. Certainly, body mass index, which is your weight corrected for mm -hmm. your height, mm -hmm. knowing your BMI and understanding that if your BMI is elevated, so the BMI ideally should be under you know, about 25. If it's between um, 25 and, and 30, you're overweight. If it's above 30, you're obese. So really when we get into that obese range, work needs to be done. When you're kind of in that overweight range, you need to make sure that you're exercising and eating the right diet. And hopefully if you apply those standards of regular exercise and a better diet, that weight will trickle down. 
but you need to understand where you are because that's a big risk factor, not only for you know cardiovascular disease, but also things like sleep apnea mm -hmm. and other conditions that go along with obesity and, and being overweight. And I would say that if you're a young woman, it's a great time for you to uh, make sure that you know what your number should be because if you become pregnant, you want to enter your pregnancy the healthiest you can be. And more women are entering their pregnancy older, potentially with more risk factors on board, so you need to make sure that this is the right decision for you to make. And then they gain weight. And, and then they, they gain more to be able to lose And then you deliver weight. an infant and you can't take care of yourself because you're so busy taking yeah. care of everyone else. Yeah. So pre-pregnancy is a good time to deal with all that. Excellent, excellent. And let's talk a little bit about um, heart attacks and how they present in women. And is it any different than how it presents in men? So I would say the classic description is chest pressure that goes into your neck um, and your arms. That's in the textbooks. That's typically what happens in middle-aged men. Elephant on the chest. Right. The chest. That's yeah. what's in our textbooks. That, because of the research, has typically what happens in middle-aged men. Though I think postmenopausal women have that as well. I think premenopausal women may have more atypical symptoms. So fatigue, shortness of breath, jaw discomfort. I've seen. I think the bottom line is that you know you have good intuition. If you feel like something's not right, go see your doctor and have it checked have out. It checked out. That's right. And don't wait until oh I. I have an appointment in two weeks. No, so I can wait until then. Right. That is so common. It's very that common. delay in care. Right. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I think is we're working really hard to educate the first responders because many first responders will show up at the home of a young woman having atypical symptoms and oh, they'll yeah. be like, You're having a panic attack. Mm -hmm. So we really want young women to recognize if they're having something that they've never felt before, you call 911. If you don't get the answer you want, you make sure you get to an emergency room and get checked out. And what has been the impact on training uh, CPR to the population in general? Well, the good news is at our last, uh, at recent meetings, uh, American Heart Association and other meetings, there's new news that suggests that the, the risk of surviving out of hospital cardiac arrest has improved dramatically. And that's because people are no longer afraid to do CPR. We have this new hands only where you don't have to do mouth to mouth resuscitation. And I think with that type of technique, we have a much better survival of people who have out of hospital cardiac arrest. Have you known of any women who have been pregnant who have had CPR? Um, no, but we've had, we've had several women who've had heart attacks during their pregnancy, which is just as scary. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. so you can get a heart attack at any point in your life, basically. Right, right. right. Except when you're a small child. Yeah. Right, but even at that, I guess if you had some malformations, you could potentially course, have one potentially, too, but that right. would be very rare. But we do have some young women that we followed whose husbands, partners, friends have done CPR and gotten them to Absolutely. survive. And, and you know, young mothers with young children have survived their heart attacks yeah. and their cardiac arrests. So I have a young patient who's nine-year-old called 911 while her husband was doing CPR, and she's doing great now, yeah. but still. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And we have some information at the end of the program for viewers Absolutely. if yes. they want to yes. see some sites yeah. on that. Yeah. Uh, any last, we have about five more minutes left, but I want to make sure that we're covering all the points that we'd like to cover to stress to people the importance of mm -hmm. really knowing their bodies. Are there any other points you would like to be adding to what we've already stated? I just want to remind women that you have to put yourself, your health, really at the top of your list. Yep. Because if you're not healthy, it's going to be hard for everyone else to manage in your life if you're not there. So take care of your health is my message. Yes, and I think that be aware, you know, I think your initial statement that most, a lot of women feel cancer is their number one threat, but actually heart disease is, is their number one threat by a lot. And just to be aware of that, and you, we have the tools, you have the tools to lower that risk. Why are women delaying in making the phone calls? How do we get them to make the phone call to their doctor when they feel something? I think they're busy. They're busy. They're busy. <laughs> They're too busy to care for themselves. Yeah. Well, I think part of it is that and women... And we've all been a little guilty of that. Yes, <laughs> we have. We have. Yes. I think there has been sort of generic unconscious bias where as physicians and nurses, we didn't recognize our female patients were at risk. Mm -hmm. And we kind of gave them that message. And then they sort of felt, I'm not at risk, so I don't have to pay attention. And now the pendulum has swung in the direction of, yes, you are at risk. You do need to pay attention. And our healthcare system is here to support you when things happen. But again, as Dr. Scott said, the majority of heart disease is preventable, so take the steps that you need to take to prevent heart disease. Let's cover a bit about um, the actual signs and symptoms of stroke, which is in that whole spectrum of cardiovascular disease. Right, so you could have blurred vision, double vision, one side of your body might be weak or numb. Again, if you feel like something's not right, you need to speak to your physician. 
or if a spouse notices you're walking in a peculiar yeah, way. Right. Or you're speaking right. in, a, in, a, speaking, in a speaking or in you a have funny a facial way. droop. Right. Things where your face or it's not symmetric. Right. Last pearls that you would like to share from your clinical experiences. I would just say that, you know, if, if you're, um, for me, being a pregnancy being my, my field of expertise, make sure you enter your pregnancy healthy. If you do develop pregnancy complications, realize that might, that might increase your risk of cardiovascular disease and do the best you can to take care of yourself and your family because, you know, helping future generations, of course. And I might add on to that, when you deliver, start that child out at an early age. Exactly. On a healthy lifestyle. lifestyle. Exactly. That's right. Absolutely. We need generational yeah. change. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mine is if you're having trouble sort of achieving these optimal lifestyle goals, bring in the people around you. Bring in your support team, your, your partner, your friends. Find people around you that will support your healthy habits. Stay away from people that undermine your good health <laughs> and really push yourself forward into a better, more optimal health plan. That makes a lot of sense. And I think the most important thing too is to have regular conversations with your physician when you go in. That's right. And have a list of items that you would like to cover that are preventive. Of course, your physician will cover them to a, a certain extent, but there may be some questions you have that you're a little embarrassed to ask. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's an excellent point just to just touch on that for a second. I really encourage my patients to always bring a list mm -hmm. and to bring a listener because hmm. the listener will take notes while the patient is talking with me. And then when they go home, the listener will say, these are the things that the doctor said to you that you might not pay attention to when you're in the hot seat. So bring a list, bring a listener. <laughs> I'm going I to like quote that. that. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Yeah. Bring a list and a listener. Yeah. That is very good and yeah. it's very important in so many circumstances yeah. in many ways. Well, it looks like we're just about out of time. Any last points you would like to share? I think we've covered, I think we've covered a lot. Covered quite yes. a bit. <laughs> quite yes. a bit. Yeah. So life expectancy in somebody who's had a heart attack or stroke or hypertension? I mean, I think these days we, there's so many advances in medical care. You know, women um, may not fare as well, but I think we're because of the improved research and understanding that women are at risk, they're doing better as time goes on. So, Thank you for joining us on Physician Focus. Thank you for having us. For more information on women and heart disease and a host of other health and medical topics, please visit our homepage at www.physicianfocus.org. I'm Dr. Mavis Jaworski. Thank you for watching. I'm Dr. Melissa Wood. And I'm Dr. Nandita Scott. Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in American women, claiming nearly 400,000 lives each year, more than all cancers combined. Yet nearly half of women are unaware that heart disease, along with stroke, pose the biggest threats to their health. It is important that women recognize their risk factors for heart disease. Amongst the biggest risks are family history and age. Heart disease that has affected a brother, sister, father, or mother is a particular concern, and the risk rises as we get older. The good news is that many other risk factors can be controlled with lifestyle changes. Keep your blood pressure and cholesterol in check, don't smoke, eat a healthy diet, exercise, and maintain a healthy weight. We urge you to talk with your healthcare provider and get screened to determine your risk of heart disease. For more information, visit the American Heart Association at goredforwomen.org. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Goodman. Raising a happy, healthy child is every parent's priority. When your child has a fever or is injured, it's easy for parents to seek medical attention. It's not so easy when kids don't want to do homework or engage at school, are withdrawn or cranky, and tough to connect with, all of which could be normal or could be signs of mental illness. Mental health problems such as ADHD, depression, and anxiety are common among children and youth. In children, these problems often look different than they do in adults. 
So it's important that parents be aware of warning signs that can indicate mental health problems. Look for relationship problems with peers or family members, trouble fulfilling responsibilities like homework and daily chores, a drop in school performance, or mood changes that last for weeks. If you observe any of these signs, talk with your child's pediatrician. For more information, visit the American Academy of Pediatrics at HealthyChildren.org.